Life of Pi, Chapter Forty Seven. The day broke, humid and overcast, with the wind warm and the sky a dense blanket of gray clouds that looked like bunched up, dirty cotton sheets. The sea had not changed; it heaved the lifeboat up and down in a regular motion. The zebra was still alive. I couldn't believe it. It had a two-foot-wide hole in its body, a fistula like a freshly erupted volcano, spewed half-eaten organs glistening in the light or giving off a dull, dry shine. Yet, in its strictly essential parts, it continued to pump with life, if weakly. Movement was confined to a tremor in the rear leg and an occasional blinking of the eyes. I was horrified. I had no idea a living being could sustain so much injury and go on living. The hyena was tense. It was not settling down to its night of rest despite the daylight. Perhaps it was a result of taking in so much food. Its stomach was grossly dilated. Orange Juice was in a dangerous mood, too. She was fidgeting and showing her teeth. I stayed where I was, curled up near the prow. I was weak in body and soul. I was afraid I would fall into the water if I tried to balance on the oar. The zebra was dead by noon. It was glassy-eyed and had become perfectly indifferent to the hyena's occasional assaults. Violence broke out in the afternoon. Tension had risen to an unbearable level. The hyena was yipping. Orange juice was grunting and making loud lip-smacking noises. All of a sudden their complaining fi fused and shot up to top volume. The hyena jumped over the remains of the zebra and made for orange juice. I believe I have made clear the menace of a hyena. It was certainly so clear in my mind that I gave up on Orange Juice's life before she even had a chance to defend it. I underestimated her. I underestimated her grit. She thumped the beast on the head. It was something shocking. It made my heart melt with love and admiration and fear. Did I mention she was a former pet, callously discarded by her Indonesian owners? Her story was like that of every inappropriate pet. It goes something like this. The pet is bought when it is small and cute. It gives much amusement to its owners. Then it grows in size and an appetite. It reveals itself incapable of being house-trained. Its increasing strength makes it harder to handle. One day, the maid pulls the sheet from its nest because she has decided to wash it, or the son jokingly pinches a morsel of food from its hands. Over some such seemingly small matter, the pet flashes its teeth in anger, and the family is frightened. The very next day, the pet finds itself bouncing at the back of a family jeep in the company of its human brothers and sisters. A jungle is entered. Everyone in the vehicle finds it strange and, for and a formidable place. A clearing is come to. It is briefly explored. All of a sudden, the jeep roars to life, and its wheels kick up dirt, and the pet sees all the ones it had known and loved looking at it from the back window as the jeep speeds away. It has been left behind. The pet does not understand. It is, unprepared, it is as unprepared for this jungle as its human siblings are. It waits around for their return, trying to quell the panic rising in it. They do not return. The sun sets. Quickly, it becomes depressed and gives up on life. It dies of hunger and exposure in the next few days, or is attacked by dogs. Orange juice could have been one of these forlorn pets. Instead, she ended up at the Pondicherry Zoo. She remained gentle and unaggressive her whole life. I have memories from when I was a child of her never-ending arms surrounding me, her fingers, each as long as my whole hand, picking at my hair. She was a young female practicing her maternal skills. As she matured into her full wild self, I observed her at a distance. I thought I knew her so well that I could predict her every move. I thought I knew not only her habits, but also her limits. This display of ferocity, of savage courage, made me realize that I was wrong. All my life I had known only a part of her. She thumped the beast on the head, and what a thump it was. The beast's head hit the bench it had just reached, making such a sharp noise, besides splaying its front legs flat out, that I thought surely either the bench or its jaw or both must break. The hyena was up again in an instant, every hair on its body as erect as the hairs on my head. But its hostility wasn't quite so kinetic now. It withdrew. I exulted. Orange Juice's stirring defense brought a glow to my heart. It didn't last long. An adult female orangutan cannot defeat, defeat an adult male spotted hyena. That is the plain empirical truth. Let it become known among zoologists. Had Orange Juice been a male, had she loomed as large on the scales as she did in my heart, it might have been another matter. But portly and overfed, though she was from living in the comfort of a zoo, even so she tipped the scales at barely 110 pounds. 
Female orangutans are half the size of males, but it is not simply a question of weight and brute strength. Orange juice was far from defenseless. What it comes down to is attitude and knowledge. What does a fruit eater know about killing? Where would it learn to bite? How hard? For how long? An orangutan may be taller, may have very strong and agile arms and long canines, but if it does not know how to use these as weapons, they are of little use. The hyena, with only its jaws, will overcome the ape because it knows what it wants and how to get it. The hyena came back. It jumped on the bench and caught orange juice at the waist before she could strike. Orange juice hit the hyena on the head with her other arm, but the blow only made the beast snarl viciously. She made to bite, but the hyena moved faster. Alas, orange juice's defense lacked precision and coherence. Her fear was something useless that only hampered her. The hyena let go of her wrist and expertly got to her throat. Dumb with pain and horror, I watched as orange juice thumped the hyena ineffectually and pulled at its hair while her throat was being squeezed by its jaws. To the end, she reminded me of us. Her eyes expressed fear in such a human-like way, as did her strained whimpers. She made an attempt to climb onto the tarpaulin. The hyena violently shook her. She fell off the bench to the bottom of the lifeboat, the hyena with her. I heard noises, but no longer saw anything. I was next. That much was clear to me. With some difficulty, I stood up. I could hardly see through the tears in my eyes. I was no longer crying because of my family, or because of my impending death. I was far too numb to consider either. I was crying because I was exceedingly tired, and it was time to get rest. I advanced over the tarpaulin. Though tautly stretched at the end of the boat, it sagged a little in the middle. It made for three or four toilsome, bouncy steps, and I had to reach over the net and the rolled-up tarpaulin. In these efforts, in a lifeboat that was constantly rolling, in the condition I was in, it felt like a great trek. When I laid my foot on the middle crossbench, its hardness had an invigorating effect on me, as if I had just stepped on solid ground. I planted both, fe both my feet on the bench and enjoyed my firm stand. I was feeling dizzy, but since the capital moment of my life was coming up, this dizziness only added to my sense of frightened sublimity. I raised my hands to the level of my chest, the weapons I had against the hyena. It looked up at me. Its mouth was red. Orange juice lay next to it, against the dead zebra. Her arms were spread wide open, and her short legs were folded together and slightly turned to one side. She looked like a simian Christ on the cross, except for her head. She was beheaded. The neck wound was still bleeding. It was a sight horrible to the eyes, and killing to the spirit. Just before throwing myself upon the hyena, to collect myself before the final struggle, I looked down. Beneath my, between my feet, under the bench, I beheld Richard Parker's head. It was gigantic. It looked the size of planet Jupiter to my dazed senses. His paws were like volumes of Encyclopedia Britannica. I had made my way back to the bow and collapsed. I spent the night in a state of delirium. I kept thinking I had slept, and was awaking after dreaming of a tiger. Chapter 48 Richard Parker was so named because of a clerical error. A panther was terrorizing the Kulna district of Bangladesh, just outside the Sundarbans. It had recently carried off a little girl. All that was found of her was a tiny hand with a henna pattern on the palm and a few plastic bangles. She was the seventh person killed in two months by the marauder, and it was growing bolder. The previous victim was a man who had been attacked in broad daylight in his field. The beast dragged him off into the forest, where it ate a good part of his head, the flesh off his right leg, and all his innards. His corpse was found hanging in the fork of a tree. The villagers kept a watch nearby that night, hoping to surprise the panther and kill it, but it never appeared. The forest department hired a professional hunter. He set up a small hidden platform in a tree near a river where two of the attacks had taken place. A goat was tied to a stake on the river's bank. The hunter waited several nights. He assumed the panther would be an old, wasted male with worn teeth, incapable of catching anything more difficult than a human. But it was a sleek tiger that stepped into the open one night. A female with a single cub. The goat bleated. Oddly, the cub, who looked, about, who looked to be about three months old, paid little attention to the goat. It raced to the water's edge, where it drank eagerly. Its mother followed suit. Of hunger and thirst, thirst is the greater imperative. Only once the tiger had quenched her thirst did she turn to the goat to satisfy her hunger. The hunter had two rifles with him. 
one with real bullets, the other with immobilizing darts. The animal was not the man-eater, but so close to human habitation she might pose a threat to the villagers, especially as she was with cub. He picked up the gun with the darts. He fired as the tiger was about to fell the goat. The tiger reared up and snarled and raced away, but immobilizing darts don't bring on sleep gently, like a good cup of tea. They knock out like a bottle of hard liquor straight up. A burst of activity on the animal's part makes it act all the faster. The hunter called his assistants on the radio. They found the tiger about 200 yards from the river. She was still conscious. Her back legs had given way and her balance on, front, on her front legs was woozy. When the men got close, she tried to get away but could not manage it. She turned on them, lifting a paw that was meant to kill. It only made her lose her balance. She collapsed, and the Pondicherry Zoo had two new tigers. The cub was found in a bush close by, meowing with fear. The hunter, whose name was Richard Parker, picked it up with his bare hands, and, remembering how it had rushed to drink in the water, River baptized it thirsty. But the shipping clerk at the Howard train station was evidently a man both befuddled and diligent. All the papers we received with the cub clearly stated that his name was Richard Parker, that the hunter's first name was Thirsty, and that his family name was None Given. Father had had a good chuckle over the mix-up, and Richard Parker's name had stuck. I don't know if Thirsty None Given ever got the man-eating panther. Chapter 49 In the morning I could not move. I was pinned by weakness to the tarpaulin. Even thinking was exhausting. I applied myself to thinking straight. At length, as slowly as the caravan of camels crossing a desert, some thoughts came through, came together. The day was like the previous one, warm and overcast. The clouds low, the breeze light. That was one thought. The boat was rocking gently. That was another. I thought of sustenance for the first time. I had not had a drop to drink or a bite to eat or a minute of sleep in three days. Finding this obvious explanation from her weakness brought me a little strength. Richard Parker was still on board. In fact, he was directly beneath me. Incredible that such a thing should not consent to be true, but it was only after much deliberation, upon assessing various mental items and points of view, that I concluded that it was not a dream or a delusion or a misplaced memory or a fancy or any other such falsity, but a solid, true thing witnessed while in a weakened, highly agitated state. The truth of it would be confirmed as soon as I felt well enough to investigate. How I had failed to notice for two and a half days a 450-pound Bengal tiger in a lifeboat 26 feet long was a conundrum I would have to try to crack later, when I had more energy. The feat surely made Richard Parker the largest stowaway, proportionally speaking, in the history of navigation. From tip of nose to tip of tail, he took up over a third of the length of the ship he was on. You might think I lost all hope at that point. I did. And as a result, I perked up and felt much better. We see that in sports all the time, don't we? The tennis challenger starts strong, but soon loses confidence in his playing. The champion racks up the games. But in the final set, when the challenger has nothing left to lose, he becomes relaxed again, insouciant, daring. Suddenly, he's playing like the devil, and the champion must work hard to get those last points. So it was with me. To cope with a hyena seemed remotely possible, but I was so obviously outmatched by Richard Parker that it wasn't even worth worrying about. With the tiger aboard, my life was over. That means settled, why not do something about my parched throat? I believe it was this that saved my life that morning, that I was quite literally dying of thirst. Now that the word had popped into my head, I couldn't think of anything else, as if the word itself were salty, and the more I thought of it, the worse the effect. I have heard that the hunger for air exceeds as a compelling sensation the thirst for water. Only for a few minutes, I say. After a few minutes you die, and the discomfort of asphyxiation goes away. Whereas thirst is a drawn-out affair. Look, Christ on the cross died of suffocation, but his only complaint was of thirst. If thirst can be so taxing that even God incarnate complains about it, imagine the effect on a regular man. It was enough to make me go raving mad. I have never known a worse physical hell than this putrid taste and pasty feeling in the mouth, this unbearable pressure at the back of the throat, the sensation that my blood was turning to a thick syrup that barely flowed. Truly, by comparison, a tiger was nothing. And so I pushed aside all thoughts of Richard Parker, and fearlessly went exploring for fresh water. 
the divining rod in my mind dipped sharply and a spring gushed water when i remembered that i was on a genuine regulation lifeboat and that such a lifeboat was surely outfitted with supplies that seemed like a perfectly reasonable proposition what captain would fail in so elementary a way to ensure the safety of his crew what ship chandler would not think of making a little extra money under the noble guise of saving lives it was settled there was water aboard all i had to do was find it which meant i had to move i made it to the middle of the boat to the edge of the tarpaulin it was a hard crawl i felt i was climbing the side of the volcano and i was about to look over the rim into a boiling cauldron of orange lava i lay flat i carefully brought my head over i did not look over any more than i had to i did not see richard parker the hyena was plainly visible though it was back behind what was left of the zebra it was looking at me i was no longer afraid of it it wasn't ten feet away yet my heart didn't skip a beat richard parker's presence had at least that useful aspect to be afraid of this ridiculous dog when there was a tiger about was like being afraid of splinters when trees are falling down i became very angry at the animal you ugly foul creature i muttered the only reason i didn't stand up and beat it off the lifeboat with a stick was lack of strength in a stick not lack of heart did the hyena sense something of my mastery did it say to itself super alpha is watching me i better not move i don't know at any rate it didn't move in fact in the way it ducked its head it seemed to want to hide from me but it was no use hiding it would get its just desserts soon enough richard parker also explained the animal's strange behavior now it was clear why the hyena had confined itself to such an absurdly small space behind the zebra and why it had waited so long before killing it it was fear of the greater beast and fear of touching the greater beast's food the strain temporary peace between orange juice and the hyena and my reprieve were no doubt due to the same reason in the face of such a superior predator all of us were prey and normal ways of praying were affected it seemed the presence of a tiger had saved me from the hyena surely a textbook example of jumping from the frying pan and into the fire but the great beast was not behaving like a great beast to such an extent that the hyena had taken liberties richard parker's passivity and for three long days needed explaining only in two ways could i account for it sedation and seasickness father regularly sedated a number of the animals to lessen their stress might he have sedated richard parker shortly before the ship sank had the shock of the shipwreck the noises the falling into the sea the terrible struggle to swim to the lifeboat increased the effect of the sedative had seasickness taken over after that these were the only plausible explanations i could come up with i lost interest in the question only water interested me I took stock of the lifeboat. Chapter 50 It was three and a half feet deep, eight feet wide, and twenty-six feet long, exactly. I know because it was printed on one of the side benches in black letters. It also said that the lifeboat was designed to accommodate a maximum of thirty-two people. Wouldn't that have been merry, sharing it with so many? Instead, we were three, and it was awfully crowded. The boat was symmetrically shaped with with rounded ends that were hard to tell apart the stern was hinted at by a small fixed rudder no more than a rearward extension of the keel whilst the bow except for my addition featured a stem with the saddest bluntest prow in boat building history the aluminum hull was studded with rivets and painted white that was the outside of the lifeboat inside it was not as spacious as might be expected because of the side benches and the buoyancy tanks the side benches ran the whole length of the boat, merging at the bow and stern to form end benches that were roughly triangular in shape. The benches were the top surfaces of the sealed buoyancy tanks. The side benches were one and a half feet wide, and the end benches were three feet deep. The open space of the lifeboat was thus twenty feet long and five feet wide. That made a territory of one hundred square feet for Richard Parker. Spanning this space, widthwise, were three cross benches, including the one smashed by the zebra. These benches were two feet wide and were evenly spaced. They were two feet above the floor of the boat. The play Richard Parker had before he would knock his head against the ceiling, so to speak, if he were beneath a bench. Under the tarpaulin, he had another twelve inches of space, the distance between the gunwale, which supported the tarpaulin, and the benches, so three feet in all, barely enough for him to stand. The floor, consisting of narrow planks of treated wood, was flat, and the vertical sides of the buoyancy tanks were at right angles to it. 
So, curiously, the boat had rounded ends and rounded sides, but the interior volume was, a rectan was rectangular. It seems orange, such a nice Hindu color, is the color of survival, because the whole inside of the boat and the tarpaulin and life jackets and the life and the oars and most every other significant object aboard was orange. Even the plastic, beadless whistles were orange. The words Simsum and Panama were printed on each side of the bow in stark black Roman capitals. The tarpaulin was made of tough, treated canvas, rough on the skin after a while. It had been unrolled to just past the middle across the bench. So one crossbench was hidden beneath the tarpaulin, in Richard Parker's den. The middle crossbench was just beyond the edge of the tarpaulin, in the open, and the third crossbench lay broken beneath the dead zebra. There were six oarlocks, U-shaped notches in the gunwale for holding an oar in place, and five oars, since I had lost one trying to push Richard Parker away. Three oars rested on one side bench, one rested on the other, and one made up my life-saving prow. I doubted the usefulness of these oars as a means of propulsion. This lifeboat was no racing shell. It was a heavy, solid construction designed for stolid floating, not for navigating. Though I suppose that if we had been thirty-two to row, we could have made some headway. I did not grasp all these details, and many more, right away. They came to my notice with time, as a result of necessity. I would be in the direst of dire straits, facing a bleak future, when some small thing, some detail, would transform itself and appear in my mind a new light. It would no longer be the small thing it was before, but the most important thing in the world, the thing that would save my life. This happened time and again. How true it is that necessity is the mother of invention. How very true. Chapter 51 But that first time I had a good look at the lifeboat, I did not see the detail I wanted. The surface of the stern and side benches was continuous and unbroken as were the sides of the buoyancy tanks. The floor lay flat against the hull. There could be no cash beneath it. It was certain. There was no locker or box or any other sort of container anywhere, only smooth, uninterrupted orange surfaces. My estimation of captains and ship chandlers wavered. My hopes for survival flickered. My thirst remained. And what if the supplies were at the bow, beneath the tarpaulin? I turned and crawled back. I felt like a dried-out lizard, I pushed down on the tarpaulin. It was tautly stretched. If I unrolled it, I would give myself access to what supplies might be stored below. But that meant creating an opening onto Richard Parker's den. There was no question. Thirst pushed me on. I eased the oar from under the tarpaulin. I placed the life buoy around my waist. I laid the oar across the bow. I leaned over the gunwale, and with my thumbs pushed from un under one of the hooks the rope that held down the tarpaulin. I had a difficult time of it. But after the first hook, it was easier with the second and the third. I did the same on the other side of the stem. The tarpaulin became slack underneath my elbows. I was lying flat on it. My legs pointed towards the stern. I unrolled it a little. Immediately I was rewarded. The bow was like the stern. It had an end bench, and upon it, just a few inches from the stem, a hasp, a hasp glittered like a diamond. There was an outline of a lid. My heart began to pound. I unrolled the tarpaulin further. I peeked under. The lid was shaped like a rounded-out triangle, three feet wide and two feet deep. At that moment I perceived an orange mass. I jerked my head back. But the orange wasn't moving and didn't look right. I looked again. It wasn't a tiger. It was a life jacket. There were a number of life jackets at the back of Richard Parker's den. A shiver went through my body. Between the life jackets, partially as if through some leaves, I had my first, unambiguous, clear-headed glimpse of Richard Parker. It was his haunches, I could see, and part of his back. Tawny and striped, and simply enormous. He was facing the stern, lying flat on his stomach. He was still except for the breathing motion of his sides. I blinked in disbelief at how close he was. He was right there, two feet beneath me. Stretching, I could have pinched his bottom, and between us there was nothing but a thin tarpaulin, easily got around. God preserve me. No supplication was ever more passionate, yet more gently carried by the breath. I, w I lay absolutely motionless. I had to have water. I brought my hand down and quietly undid the hasp. I pulled on the lid. It opened into a locker. I have just mentioned the notion of details that became lifesavers. Here was one. The lid was hinged on an inch or so from the edge of the bow bench, which meant that the lid opened, 
it became a barrier that closed off the twelve inches of open space between tarpaulin and bench through which richard parker could get to me after pushing a set of life jackets i opened the lid till it fell against the crosswise oar and the edge of the tarpaulin i moved onto the stem facing the boat one foot on the edge of the open locker the other against the lid if richard parker decided to attack me from below he would have to push on the lid such a push would both warn me and help me fall backwards into the water with a life buoy if he came the other way climbing atop the tarpaulin from a stern i was in the best position to see him clearly and again take to the water i looked about the lifeboat i couldn't see any sharks i looked down between my legs i thought i would faint for joy the open locker glistened with shiny new things oh the delight of the manufactured good the man-made device the created thing that moment of material revelation brought an intensity of pleasure a heady mix of hope surprise disbelief thrill gratitude all crushed into one unequalled in my life by any christmas birthday wedding diwali or other gift-giving occasion i was positively giddy with happiness my eyes immediately fell upon what i was looking for whether in a bottle a tin can or a carton water is unmistakably packaged on this lifeboat the wine of life was served into pale golden cans that fit nicely in the hand drinking water said the vintage label in black letters hp foods ltd were the vintners 500 milliliters were the contents there were stacks of these cans, too many to count at a glance. With a shaking hand, I reached down and picked one up. It was cool to the touch and heavy. I shook it. The bubble of air inside made a dull glub, glub, glub sound. I was about to be delivered from my hellish thirst. My pulse raced at the thought. I only had to open the can. I paused. How would I do that? I had a can. Surely I had a can opener. I looked in the locker. There was a great quantity of things. I rummaged about. I was losing patience. Aching expectation had run its fruitful course. I had to drink now, or I would die. I could not find the desired instrument, but there was no time for useless distress. Action was needed. Could I prise it open with my fingernails? I tried. I couldn't. My teeth? It wasn't worth trying. I looked over the gunwale, the tarpaulin hooks short, blunt, solid. I kneeled on the bench and leaned over, holding the can with both my hands. I sharply brought it up against the hook. A good dent. I did it again. Another dent next to the first. By dint of denting, I managed the trick. A pearl of water appeared. I licked it off. I turned the can and banged the opposite side of the top against the hook to make another hole. It worked like a fiend. I made a larger hole. I sat back on the gunwale. I held the can up to my face. I opened my mouth. I tilted the can. My feelings can perhaps be imagined, but they can hardly be described. To the gurgling beat of my greedy throat, pure, delicious, beautiful crystalline water flowed into my system. Liquid life, it was. I drained that golden cup to the very last drop, sucking at the hole to catch any remaining moisture. I went, ah, tossed the can overboard and got another one. I opened it the way I had the first, and its contents vanished just as quickly. That can sailed overboard, too, and I opened the next one which shortly also ended up in the ocean. Another can was dispatched. I drank four cans, two liters of the most exquisite of nectars, before I stopped. You might think such a rapid intake of water after prolonged thirst might upset my system. Nonsense. I never felt better in my life. Why, feel my brow. My forehead was wet with fresh, clean, refreshing perspiration. Everything in me, right down to the pores of my skin, was expressing joy. A sense of well-being quickly overcame me. My mouth became moist and soft. I forgot about the back of my throat. My skin relaxed. My joints moved with greater ease. My heart began to beat like a merry drum, and blood started flowing through my veins like cars from a wedding party honking their way through town. Strength and suppleness came back to my muscles. My head became clearer. Truly, I was coming back to life from the dead. It was glorious. It was glorious. I tell you, to be drunk on alcohol is disgraceful. But to be drunk on water is noble and ecstatic. I basked in bliss and plentitude for several minutes. A certain emptiness made itself felt. I touched my belly. It was a hard and hollow cavity. Food would be nice now. A masala desai with a coconut chutney. Mmm. Even better, uthapam. Mmm. Oh, I brought my hands to my mouth. Idly, the mere thought of the word provoked a shot of pain behind my jaws. 
and a deluge of saliva in my mouth. My right hand started twitching. It reached the, and nearly touched the delicious flattened balls of parboiled rice in my imagination. It sank its fingers into their steaming hot flesh. It formed a ball soaked with sauce. It, I, it brought it to my mouth. I chewed. Oh, it was exquisitely painful. I looked into the locker for food. I found cartons of Seven Oceans Standard Emergency Ration from far away, exotic virgin, Norway. The breakfast that was to make up for nine missed meals, not to mention odd tiffins that mother had brought along, came in a half-kilo block, dense, solid, and vacuum-packed in silver-colored plastic that was covered with instructions in twelve languages. In English it said the ration consisted of eighteen fortified biscuits of baked wheat, animal fat, and glucose, and that no more than six should be eaten in a twenty-four-hour period. Pity about the fat, but given the exceptional circumstances, the vegetarian part of me would simply pinch its nose and bear it. At the top of the block were the words, Tear here to open, and a black arrow pointing to the edge of the plastic. The edge gave way under my fingers. Nine wax paper wrapped rectangular bars tumbled out. I unwrapped one, and naturally broke into two. Two nearly square biscuits, pale in color and fragrant in smell. I bit into one. Lord, who would have thought? I never suspected. It was a secret held for me. Norwegian cuisine was the best in this world. These biscuits were amazingly good. They were savory and delicate to the palate, neither too sweet nor too salty. They broke up under the teeth with a delightful crunching sound. Mixed with saliva, they made a granular paste that was enchantment to the tongue and mouth. And when I swallowed, my stomach had only one thing to say. Hallelujah. The whole package disappeared in a few minutes, wrapping paper flying away in the wind. I considered opening another carton, but I thought better. No harm in exercising a little restraint. Actually, with half a kilo of emergency ration in my stomach, I felt quite heavy. I decided I should find out what exactly was in the treasure chest before me. It was a large locker, larger than its opening. The space extended right down to the hole and ran some little ways into the side benches. I lowered my feet into the locker and sat on its edge, my back against the stem. I counted the cartons of seven ocean. I had eaten one. There were thirty-one left. According to the instructions, each 500-gram carton was supposed to last one survivor three days. That meant I had food rations to last me 31 times 3, 93 days. The instructions also suggested survivors restrict themselves to half a liter of water every 24 hours. I counted the cans of water. There were 124. Each counted half a liter. So I had water rations to last me for 124 days. Never had simple arithmetic brought such a smile to my face. What else did I have? I plunged my arm eagerly into the locker and brought up one marvelous object after another. Each one, no matter what it was, soothed me. I was so sorely in need of company and comfort that the attention brought to making each one of these mass-produced goods felt like a special attention to, paid to me. I repeatedly mumbled, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Chapter 52 After a thorough investigation, I made a complete list. 192 tablets of anti-seasickness medicine, 124 tin cans of fresh water, each containing 500 milliliters, so 62 liters in all, 32 plastic vomit bags, 31 cartons of emergency rations, 500 grams each, so 15.5 kilos in all, 16 wool blankets, 12 solar stills, 10 or so orange life jackets, each with an orange beadless whistle attached by a string, 6 morphine ampule syringes, six hand flares, five buoyant oars, four rocket parachute flares, three tough, transparent plastic bags, each with a capacity of about 50 liters, three can openers, three graduated glass beakers for drinking, ten boxes of waterproof matches, two buoyant orange smoke signals, two mid-sized orange plastic buckets, two buoyant orange plastic bailing cups, two multi-purpose plastic containers with airtight lids, two yellow rectangular sponges, two buoyant synthetic ropes, each 50 meters long, two non-buoyant synthetic ropes of unspecified length, but each at least 30 meters long, two fishing nets with hooks, lines, and sinkers, two gaffs with very sharp barbed hooks, two sea anchors, two hatchets, two rain catchers, two black ink ballpoint pens, one nylon cargo net, one solid life buoy with an inner diameter of 40 centimeters and an outer diameter of 80 centimeters and an attached rope. One large hunting knife with a solid handle, 
at a, a pointed end and one edge a sharp blade and the other a sawtooth blade attached by a long string to a ring in the locker one sewing kit with straight and curving needles and strong white thread one first aid kit in a waterproof plastic case one signaling mirror one pack of filter tipped chinese cigarettes one large bar of dark chocolate one survival manual one compass one notebook with 98 lined pages one boy with a complete set of light clothing but for one lost shoe one spotted hyena one bengal tiger one lifeboat one ocean one god i ate a quarter of the large chocolate bar i examined one of the rain catchers it was a device that looked like an inverted umbrella with a good-sized parchment catchment pouch and a connecting rubber tube i crossed my arms and the life boy around my waist brought my head down and fell soundly asleep chapter fifty three i slept all morning i was roused by anxiety that tide of food water and rest that flowed through my weakened system bringing me to a new lease on life also brought me the strength to see how desperate my situation was i awoke to the reality of richard parker there was a tiger in the lifeboat i could hardly believe it yet i knew i had to and i had to save myself i considered jumping overboard and swimming away but my body refused to move i was hundreds of miles from landfall if not over a thousand miles i couldn't swim just such a distance even with a life buoy what would i eat what would i drink how would i keep the sharks away how would i keep warm how would i know which way to go there was not a shadow of a doubt about the matter to leave the lifeboat meant certain death but what about staying aboard he would come at me like a typical cat without a sound before i knew it he would seize the back of my neck or my throat and i would be pierced by fang holes i wouldn't be able to speak my lifeblood would flow out of me unmarked by a final utterance or he would kill me by clubbing me with one of his great paws breaking my neck i'm going to die i blubbered through quivering lips oncoming death is terrible enough but worse still is oncoming death with time to spare time in which all the happiness that was yours and all the happiness that might have been yours becomes clear to you you see with utter lucidity all that you are losing the sight brings on an oppressive sadness that no car about to hit you or water about to drown you can match the feeling is truly unbearable the words father mother ravi india winnipeg struck me with searing poignancy i was giving up i would have given up if a voice had made itself heard in my heart the voice said i will not die i refuse it i will make it through this nightmare i will beat the odds as great as they are i have survived so far miraculously now i will turn miracle into routine the amazing will be seen every day i will put in all the hard work necessary yes so long as god was with me i will not die amen my face set to a grim and determined expression i speak in all modesty as i say this but i discovered at that moment that i have become a fierce will to live it's not something evident in my experience some of us give up on life with only a resigned sigh others fight a little then lose hope still others and i one of those never give up we fight and fight and fight we fight no matter the cost of battle the losses we take the improbabil the improbability of success we fight to the very end it's not a question of courage it's something constitutional an inability to let go maybe something more than life-hungry stupidity richard parker started growling at that very instant as if he had been waiting for me to become a worthy opponent my chest became tight with fear quick man quick i wheezed i had to organize my survival not a second to waste i needed shelter and right away i thought of the prow i had made with an oar but now the tarpaulin was unrolled at the bow there was nothing to hold the oar in place and i had no proof that hanging at the end of the oar provided real safety from richard parker he might easily reach and nab me i had to find something else my mind worked fast i built a raft the oars if you remember floated and i had life jackets and a sturdy life buoy with bated breath i closed the locker and reached beneath the tarpaulin for the extra oars on the side benches richard parker noticed i could see him through the life jackets as i dragged each oar out you can imagine how carefully he stirred in reaction but he did not turn i pulled out three oars a fourth was already resting crosswise on the tarpaulin i raised the locker lid to close the opening onto richard parker's den i had four buoyant oars 
I set them on the tarpaulin around the life buoy. The life buoy was now squared by the oars. My raft looked like a game of tic-tac-toe, with an O in the center, as the first move. Now came the dangerous part. I needed the life jackets. Richard Parker's growling was now a deep rumble that shook the air. The hyena responded with a whine, a wavering, high-pitched whine, a sure sign that trouble was on the way. I had no choice. I had to act. I lowered the lid again. The life jackets were at a hand's reach. Some were right against Richard Parker. The hyena broke into a scream. I reached for the closest life jacket. I had difficulty grasping it. My hand was trembling so much. I pulled the jacket out. Richard Parker did not seem to notice. I pulled another one. And another. I was feeling faint with fear. I was having great difficulty breathing. If need be, I told myself, I could throw myself overboard with these life jackets. I pulled a last one out. I had four life jackets. Pulling the oars in one after the next, I worked them through the armholes of the life jackets, in one armhole, out the other, so that the life jackets became secured to the four corners of the raft, and I tied each one shut. I found one of the buoyant ropes in the locker. With one with a knife, I cut four segments. I, I tightly lashed the four oars where they met. Ah, to have had a practical education in knots. At each corner I made ten knots, and still I was worried that the oars would come apart. I worked feverishly, all the while cursing my stupidity. A tiger aboard, and I had waited three days and three nights to save my life. I cut four more segments of the buoyant rope and tied the life buoy to each side of the square. I wove the life buoy's rope through the life jackets, around the oars, in and out of the life buoy, all around the raft, as yet another precaution against the raft breaking into pieces. The hyena was now screaming at top pitch. One last thing to do. God give me the time, I implored. I took the rest of the buoyant line. There was a hole that went through the stem of the boat, near the top. I brought the, the buoyant rope through it and hitched it. I only had to hitch the other end of the rope to the raft, and I might be saved. The hyena fell silent. My heart stopped and then beat triple speed. I turned. Jesus, Mary, Muhammad, and Vishnu. I saw a sight that will stay with me for the rest of my days. Richard Parker had risen and emerged. He was not fifteen feet from me. Oh, the size of him! The hyena's end had come, and mine. I stood rooted to the spot, paralyzed, enthralled to the action before my eyes. My brief experience with the relations of unconfined wild animals and lifeboats had made me expect great noise and protest when the time came for the bloodshed, but it happened practically in silence. The hyena died neither whining nor whimpering, and Richard Parker killed without a sound. The flame-colored carnivore emerged from beneath the tarpaulin and made for the hyena. The hyena was leaning against the stern bench, behind the zebra's carcass, transfixed. It had not put up a fight. Instead, it shrank to the floor, lifting a forepaw in a futile gesture of defense. The look on its face was of terror. The massive paw landed on its shoulders. Richard Parker's jaws closed on the side of the hyena's neck. Its glazed eyes widened. There was a noise of organic crunching, as windpipe and spinal cord were crushed. The hyena shook. Its eyes went dull. It was over. Richard Parker let go and growled, but a quiet growl, private and half-hearted, it seemed. He was panting, his tongue hanging from his mouth. He licked his chops. He shook his head. He sniffed the dead hyena. He raised his head high and smelled the air. He placed his forepaws on the stern bench and lifted himself. His feet were wide apart. The rolling of the boat, though gentle, was visibly not to his liking. He looked beyond the gunwale at the open seas. He put out a low, mean snarl. He smelled the air again. He slowly turned his head. It turned, turned, turned full around, till he was looking straight at me. I wish I could describe what happened next, not as I saw it, which I might manage, but as I felt it. I beheld Richard Parker from the angle that showed him off to the greatest effect, from the back, half raised with his head turned. The stance had something of a pose to it, as if it were intentional, even affected, display of mighty art. And what art, what might. His presence was overwhelming, yet equally evident was the lightsome grace of it. He was incredibly muscular, yet his haunches were thin and his glossy coat hung loosely on his frame. His body, bright brownish-orange streaked with black vertical, vertical stripes, was incomparably beautiful, matched with a tailor's eye for harmony by his pure white chest and underside and the black rings of his long tail. His head was large and round, displaying formidable sideburns, 
a stylish goatee and some of the finest whiskers of the cat world thick long and white atop the head were small expressive ears shaped like perfect arches his carrot orange face had a broad bridge and a pink nose and it was made up with a brazen flare wavy dabs of black circled the face in a pattern that was striking yet subtle for it brought less attention to itself than it did to one part of the face left untouched by it the bridge whose rufous luster shone nearly with a radiance the patches of white above the eyes on the cheeks and around the mouth came off as finishing touches worthy of a cathacoly dancer the result was a face that looked like the wings of a butterfly and bore an expression vaguely old and chinese but when richard parker's amber eyes met mine the stare was intense cold and unflinching not flighty or friendly and spoke of self-possession on the point of exploding with rage his ears twitched and then swiveled right around one of his lips began to rise and fall the yellow canine thus coyly revealed was as long as my longest finger every hair on me was standing up shrieking with fear that's when the rat appeared out of nowhere a scrawny brown rat materialized on the side bench nervous and breathless richard parker looked as astonished as i was the rat leapt under the tarpaulin and raced my way at the sight and shock and surprise my legs gave way beneath me and i practically fell into the locker before my incredulous eyes the rodent hopped over the various parts of the raft jumped on to me and climbed to the top of my head where i felt its little claws clamping down on my scalp holding on for dear life richard parker's eyes had followed the rat they were now fixed on my head he completed the turn of his head with a slow turn of his body moving his forepaws sideways along the side bench he dropped to the floor of the boat with ponderous ease i could see the top of his head his back and his long curled tail his ears lay flat against his skull in three paces he was at the middle of the boat without an effort the front half of his body rose in the air and his forepaws came to rest on the rolled up edge of the tarpaulin he was less than ten feet away his chest his head his paws so big so big his teeth an entire army battalion in the mouth he was making a jump onto the tarpaulin i was about to die but the tarpaulin's strange softness bothered him he pressed at it tentatively he looked up anxiously the exposure to so much light and open space did not please him either and the rolling motion of the boat continued to unsettle him for a brief moment richard parker was hesitating i grabbed the rat and threw it his way i can still see in my mind as it sailed through the air its outstretched claws and erect tail its tiny elongated scrotum and pinpoint anus richard parker opened his maw and the squealing rat disappeared into it like a baseball into a catcher's mitt its hairless tail vanished like a spaghetti noodle sucked into a mouth he seemed satisfied with the offering he backed down and returned beneath the tarpaulin my legs instantly became functional again i leapt up and raised the locker lid again to block the open space between bow bench and tarpaulin i heard a loud sniffing and the noise of a body being dragged his shifting weight made the boat rock a little i began hearing the sound of a mouth eating i peeked beneath the, tar the tarpaulin he was in the middle of the boat he was eating the hyena by great chunks voraciously this chance would not come again i reached and retrieved the re remaining life jackets six in all and the last oar they would go to improving the raft i noticed in passing a, in passing a smell it was not the sharp smell of cat piss it was vomit there was a patch of it on the floor of the boat it must have come from richard parker so he was indeed seasick i hitched the long rope to the raft lifeboat and raft were now tethered next i attached a life jacket to each side of the raft and its underside another life jacket i strapped across the hull of the life buoy to act as a seat i turned the last oar into the footrest lashing it to one side of the raft about two feet from the life buoy and trying to remain and tr tying the remaining life jacket to it my fingers trembled as i worked and my breath was short and strained i checked and rechecked all my knots i looked about the sea only great gentle swells no white caps the wind was low and constant i looked down there were fish big fish with protruding foreheads and very long dorsal fins dorados they were called are small and smaller fish lean and long unknown to me and smaller ones still and there were sharks i eased the raft off the lifeboat if for some reason it did not float i was as good as dead it took to the water beautifully in fact the buoyancy of the life jackets was such that they pushed the oars and life away right out of the water my heart sank as soon as the raft touched the water the fish scattered 
except for the sharks. They remained, three or four of them. One swam directly beneath the raft. Richard Parker growled. I felt like a prisoner being pushed off a plank by pirates. I brought the raft as close to the lifeboat as the protruding tips of the oars would allow. I leaned out and lay my hands on the life buoy. Through the cracks in the floor of the raft, yawning crevices would be more accurate, I looked directly into the bottomless depths of the sea. I heard Richard Parker again. I flopped onto the raft on my stomach. I lay flat and spread eagled and did not move a finger. I expected the raft to overturn at any movement, or a shark to lunge and bite right through the life jackets and oars. Neither happened. The raft sank lower and pitched and rolled, the tips of the oars dipping under water, but it floated robustly. Sharks came close, but did not touch. I felt a gentle tug. The raft swung round. I raised my head. The lifeboat and the raft had already separated as far as the rope would go, about forty feet. The rope tensed and lifted out of the water and wavered in the air. It was a highly distressing sight. I had fled the lifeboat to save my life. Now I wanted to get back. This raft business was far too precarious. It only needed a shark to bite the rope, or a knot to, be, to come undone, or a large wave to crash upon me, and I would be lost. Compared to the raft, the lifeboat now seemed a haven of comfort and security. I gingerly turned over. I sat up. Stability was good, so far. My footrest worked well enough, but it was all too small. There was just enough space to sit on and no more. This toy raft mini raft, micro raft, might do for a pond, but not for the Pacific Ocean. I took hold of the rope and pulled. The closer I got to the lifeboat, the slower I pulled. When I was next to the lifeboat, I heard Richard Parker. He was still eating. I hesitated for long minutes. I stayed on the raft. I didn't see what else I could do. My options were limited to perching above the tiger or hovering over the sharks. I knew perfectly well how dangerous Richard Parker was. Sharks, on the other hand, had not yet proved to be dangerous. I checked the knots that held the rope to the lifeboat and to the raft. I let the rope out until I was thirty feet or so from the lifeboat. The distance that about rightly balanced my two fears, being too close to Richard Parker and being too far from the lifeboat. The extra rope, ten feet or so, I looped around the near footrest oar. I could easily let out slack if the need arose. The day was ending. It started to rain. It had been overcast and warm all day. Now the temperature dropped, and the downpour was steady and cold. All around me heavy drops of fresh water plopped loudly and wastefully into the sea, dimpling its surface. I pulled on the rope again. When I was at the bow, I turned onto my knees and took hold of the stem. I pulled myself up, or up and carefully peeped over the gunwale. He wasn't in sight. I hurriedly reached down into the locker. I grabbed a rain catcher, a 50-liter plastic bag, a blanket, and a survival manual. I slammed the locker lid shut. I didn't mean to slam it, only to protect my precious goods from the rain, but the lid slipped from my wet hand. It was a bad mistake. In the very act of revealing myself to Richard Parker by bringing down what blocked his view, I made a great loud noise to attract his attention. He was crouched over the hyena. His head turned instantly. Many animals intensely dislike being disturbed while they are eating. Richard Parker snarled. His claws tensed. The tip of his tail twitched electrically. I fell back onto the raft, and I believe it was terror as much as wind and current that widened the distance between raft and lifeboat so swiftly. I let out all the rope. I expected Richard Parker to burst forth from the boat, sailing through the air, teeth and claws reaching for me. I kept my eyes on the boat. The longer I looked, the more unbearable was the expectation. He did not appear. By the time I had opened the rain catcher above my head and tucked my feet into the plastic bag, I was already soaked to the bones, and a blanket had got wet when I fell back into the raft. I wrapped myself with it nonetheless. Night crept up. My surroundings disappeared into pitch-black darkness. Only the regular tugging of the rope and the raft told me I was still attached to the lifeboat. The sea, inches beneath me yet too far from my eyes, buffeted the raft. Fingers of water reached up furtively through the cracks and wet my bottom. Chapter 54 it rained all night. I had a horrible, sleepless time of it. It was noisy. On the rain catcher, the rain made a drumming sound, and around me, coming from the darkness beyond, it made a hissing sound, as if I were at the center of a great nest of angry snakes. Shifts in the wind changed the direction of the rain, so that parts of me were beginning to feel warm, were soaked anew. 
I shifted the rain catcher, only to be unpleasantly surprised a few minutes later when the wind changed once more. I tried to keep a small part of me dry and warm, around my chest, where I had placed the survival manual, but the wetness spread with perverse determination. I spent the whole night shivering with cold. I worried constantly that the raft would come apart, that the knots holding me to the lifeboat would become loose, that the shark would attack. With my hands, I checked the knots and lashings incessantly, trying to read them the way a blind man would read Braille. The rain grew stronger and the sea rougher as the night progressed. The rope to the lifeboat tautened, with a jerk rather than with a tug, and the rocking of the raft became more pronounced and erratic. It continued to float, rising above every wave, but there was no freeboard, and the surf of every breaking wave rode clear across it, washing me like a river washing around a boulder. The sea was warmer than the rain, but it meant that not the smallest part of me stayed dry that night. At least I drank. I wasn't really thirsty, but I forced myself to drink. The rain catcher looked like an inverted umbrella, an umbrella blown open by the wind. The rain flowed to its center, where there was a hole. The hole was connected by a rubber tube to a catchment pouch made of thick, transparent plastic. At first, the water had a rubbery taste, but quickly the rain rinsed the catcher, and the water tasted fine. During those long, cold, dark hours, as the pattering of the invisible rain got to be deafening, and the sea hissed and coiled and tossed me about, I held on one I held on to one thought, Richard Parker. I hatched several plans to get rid of him so that the lifeboat might be mine. Plan number one push him off the lifeboat. What good would that do? Even if I did manage to shove four hundred and fifty pounds of living fierce animal off the lifeboat, tigers are accomplished swimmers. In the sun Sunderbins, they have been known to swim five miles in open choppy waters. If he found himself unexpectedly overboard, Richard Parkerley would simply tread water climb back aboard and make me pay for the pay my price for the treachery. Plan number two. Kill him with six morphine syringes. But I had no idea what effect they would have on him. Would they be enough to kill him? And how exactly was I supposed to get the morphine into his system? I could remotely conceive surprising him once, for an instant, the way his mother had been when she was captured. But to surprise him long enough to give him six consecutive injections? Impossible. All I would do by pricking him with a needle would be to get a cuff in return that would take my head off. Plan number three. Attack him with all available weaponry. Ludicrous. I wasn't Tarzan. I was a puny, feeble, vegetarian life form. In India, it took riding atop great big elephants and shooting with powerful rifles to kill tigers. What was I supposed to do here? Fire off a rocket flare in his face? Go at him with a hatchet in each hand and a knife between my teeth? Finish him off with straight and curving sewing needles? If I managed to nick him, it would be a feat. In return, he would tear me apart limb by limb, organ by organ. For if there's one thing more dangerous than a healthy animal, it's an injured animal. Plan number four. Choke him. I had rope. If I stayed at the bow and got the rope to go around the stern, and a noose to go around his neck, I could pull on the rope while he pulled to get at me. Even so, in the very act of reaching for me, he would choke himself. A clever suicidal plan. Plan number five. Poison him, set him on fire, electrocute him. How? With what? Plan number six. Wage a war of attrition. All I had to do was let the unforgiving laws of nature run their course, and I could be saved. Waiting for him to waste away and die would require no effort on my part. And I had supplies for months to come. What did he have? Just a few dead animals that would soon go bad. What would he eat after that? Better still, where would he get water? He might last for weeks without food, but no animal however mighty, can do without water for any extended period of time. A modest glow of hope flickered to life within me, like a candle in the night. I had a plan, and it was a good one. I only needed to survive to put it into effort, into effect. Chapter 55 Dawn came, and matters were worse for it, because now, emerging from the darkness, I could see what before I had only felt, the great curtains of rain crashing down on me from towering heights, and the waves that threw a path over me and trod me underfoot one after another. Dull-eyed, shaking and numb, one hand gripping the rain catcher, the other clinging to the raft, I continued to wait. Some time later, with the suddenness emphasized by a silence that followed, the rain stopped. The sky cleared and the waves seemed to flee with the clouds. The change was as quick and radical as changing countries on land. I was now in a different ocean. Soon the sun was alone in the sky, and the ocean was a smooth skin reflecting the light with a million mirrors. I was stiff, sore and exhausted, barely grateful to be alive. 
the words plan number six plan number six plan number six repeated themselves in my mind like a mantra and brought me a small measure of comfort though i couldn't recall for the life of what plan number six was warmth started coming to my bones i closed the rain catcher i wrapped myself with a blanket and curled up on my side in such a way that no part of me touched the water i fell asleep i don't know how long i slept it was mid-morning when i awoke and hot the blanket was nearly dry it had been a brief bout of deep sleep i lifted myself onto an elbow all about me was flatness and infinity an endless panorama of blue there was nothing to block my view the vastness hit me like a punch in the stomach i fell back winded this raft was a joke it was nothing but a few sticks and a little cork held together by string water came through every crack the death beneath would make a bird dizzy i caught sight of the lifeboat it was no better than a half walnut shell it held onto the surface of the water like fingers gripping an edge on the cliff it was only a matter of time before gravity pulled it down my fellow castaway came into view he raised himself onto the gunwale and looked my way the sudden appearance of a tiger is arresting in any environment but it was all the more so here the weird contrast between the bright striped living orange of his coat and the inert white of the boat's hull was incredibly compelling my overwrought senses screeched to a halt vast as the pacific was around us suddenly between us it seemed a very narrow moat with no bars or walls plan number six plan number six plan number six my mind whispered urgently but what was plan number six ah yes the war of attrition the waiting game passivity letting things happen the unforgiving laws of nature the relentless march of time and the hoarding of resources that was plan number six a thought rang in my mind like an angry shout you fool and you idiot you dimwit you brainless baboon plan number six is the worst plan of all richard parker is afraid of the sea right now it was nearly his grave but crazed with thirst and hunger he will surmount his fear and he will do whatever is necessary to appease his need he will turn this moat into a bridge he will swim as far as he has to to catch the drifting raft and the food upon it as for water have you forgotten that tigers from the sunderbins are known to drink saline water do you really think you can outlast his kidneys i tell you if you wage a war of attrition you will lose you will die is that clear chapter fifty six i must say a word about fear it is life's only true opponent only fear can defeat life it is a clever treacherous adversary how well i know it has no decency respects no law or convention shows no mercy it goes for your weakest spot which it finds with unerring ease it begins in your mind always one moment you are feeling calm self-possessed happy then fear disguised in the garb of mild-mannered doubt slips into your mind like a spy doubt meets disbelief and disbelief tries to push it out but disbelief is a poorly armed foot soldier doubt does away with it with little trouble you become anxious reason comes to do battle for you you are assured reason is fully equipped with the latest weapons technology but to your amazement despite superior tactics and a number of undeniable victories reason is laid low you feel yourself weakening wavering your anxiety becomes dread fear next turns fully to your body which is already aware that something terribly wrong is going on already your lungs have flown away like a bird and your guts have slithered away like a snake now your tongue drops dead like a possum while your jaw begins to gallop on the spot your ears go deaf your muscles begin to shiver as if they had malaria and your ease to shake as though they were dancing your heart strains too hard while your sphincter relaxes too much and so with the rest of your body every part of you in the manner most suited to it falls apart only your eyes work well they always pay proper attention to fear quickly you make rash decisions you dismiss your last allies hope and trust there you've defeated yourself fear which is but an impression has triumphed over you the matter is difficult to put into words for fear real fear such as shakes you to your foundation such as you feel when you are brought face to face with your mortal end nestles in your memory like a gangrene it seeks to rot everything even the words with which to speak of it so you must fight hard to express it you must fight hard to shine a light of words upon it because if you don't if your fear becomes a wordless darkness that you avoid perhaps even manage to forget 
you open yourself to further attacks of fear because you never truly fought the opponent who defeated you